In this second presentation of Sin in the Church, we'll continue the topic of dealing with sin. What is a watchman? A person that stands guard or watches for something, such as keeping a group of people from harm. Someone that protects by watching for thieves or evildoers. In a church or religious group, this would be those that are to keep watch over the church, to keep error from coming in, to protect the people from sin or the effects of sin. It is no time now to tolerate sleepy watchmen, and they never should have been tolerated. Review and Herald, March 24, 1896. Do you have sleepy watchmen in your church? Are you a sleepy watchman? Will you be like Ezra or Nehemiah? We're told that, in the work of reform to be carried forward today, there is need of men who, like Ezra and Nehemiah, will not palliate or excuse sin, nor shrink from vindicating the honor of God. Men who will not hold their peace when wrong is done, neither will they cover evil with a cloak of false charity. They will remember that God is no respecter of persons. Conflict and Courage, page 269. Notice what's said about John the Baptist. The message we bear must be as direct as was the message of John. He rebuked kings for their iniquity. And our work in this age must be as faithfully done. Second Selected Messages, page 151. The work of John was to expose the character of the work of the Pharisees, to set their traditions and heresies in their true light before the people. Review and Herald, April 3, 1895. John exposed the hypocrisy, errors, and sins of leaders in the church who were doing wrong and harm to God's people. Kings and rulers came to the wilderness to hear the prophet and were interested and deeply convicted as he fearlessly pointed out their particular sins. Second Spirit of Prophecy, page 48. God requires his people in this age of the world to stand for the right as unflinchingly as did John in opposition to soul-destroying errors. Acts of the Apostles, page 554. It's very interesting that those whose sins were pointed out by John the Baptist actually came to listen to him, and some were convicted. This reminds me also of Nicodemus who came privately to Jesus. Are we meeting this requirement of God to stand for right as unflinchingly as John the Baptist? Are we opposing soul-destroying errors that are coming into the church today? Are we awake even to know what errors have been coming in? Maybe some of you are thinking, we just need to pray more and ask God to stop the wrong from coming into our church. While praying is very good, is it the full solution to the sins coming into the church? Do you remember the story of Zimri in the Old Testament? It says, Zimri, a prince of the chief house in the tribe of Simeon, publicly appeared before the people leading a Midianitish harlot, one of high standing, a daughter of a chief house in Midian, in the sight of Moses and the congregation. He thus showed open contempt of God. He gloried in his shame, for wine had perverted his senses. Moses and the people, who had taken no part in this great departure from God's law, were weeping and lamenting at the door of the tabernacle for the sins of the people, and the plague that had begun. The priests were weeping between the porch and the altar, crying, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach. Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, and rose up from among the congregation, and took a javelin, and went after the man of Israel into the tent, and killed them both. This stayed the plague. The point to be marked is that Moses' prayers were not heard, neither his weeping nor the sorrow, and the prayers of those who had maintained their integrity, until justice was executed upon that demoralized, God-defying prince. God says of Phinehas, He hath turned away my wrath from the children of Israel. It was the greatest mercy that Phinehas could do to Israel, to deal promptly and decidedly with the guilty, and thus be instrumental in turning the wrath of God from the congregation of Israel. Something besides prayers and tears are needed in a time when reproach and peril are hanging over God's people. The wicked works must be brought to an end. Review and Herald, May 17, 1887. Though much prayer is necessary in allowing us to be led by God to deal with sin, 
we see there is more than just prayer that's needed. As it says, we are required to deal promptly and decidedly with the guilty, or even those of us who are not involved in the sin will suffer consequences for our inaction. Here are a few more quotes on this topic as related to prayer. Review and Herald, June 3, 1880, it says, We entreat those who have a connection with God to pray earnestly and in faith, and not to stop here, but to work as well as pray for the purification of the church. Encouraging Conflict, page 120, it says, The sin of one man caused Israel to be beaten before the enemy. Something more than prayer was required. They were to get up and cleanse the camp of Israel. Let's not fool ourselves and think that God is just going to clean up the church for us someday. We must realize he requires us to learn how to deal with sins and to do our part. Some people say it's criticism and not Christ-like to rebuke or show people their sins. Is this true? Upward look, page 220. Jesus never purchased peace by covering iniquity or by anything like compromise. He was never indulgent to their sins. He was too much their friend to remain silent while they were pursuing a course which would ruin their souls. Christ, at the very beginning of his ministry, openly rebuked the superficial morality and ostentatious piety of the Jews. Are you like Christ in this manner? Or do you keep silent when you know members or leaders are pursuing a course that not only would ruin their souls, but that of other members too? Will you commit to being like Christ in this regard? Are you able to give a good explanation of the difference between criticism and rebuke? Then spake Jesus to the multitude, saying, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers! Matthew 3, 1-33 The Lord did not permit the sins of his people to pass without rebuke. Signs of the Times, June 2, 1881 Jesus did not let the matter drop without administering a rebuke to his enemies. Second Spirit of Prophecy, page 197 How many of you have done as Jesus did when dealing with hypocrisy of the leaders by calling them snakes or vipers? You need to spend some time thinking about why would Christ use language like this? Was he being loving and kind by calling them snakes or vipers? Notice the exclamation mark after the word hypocrites. Maybe you've been taught it's wrong to speak to leaders in this manner. Ask yourself, would Christ do anything we should not do? In what manner did he say it? Did he say, oh, you nice little sweet snakes? Or was he firm and yet sorrowful that he had to do this? Why? Why did he use language like this? Maybe you have some preconceived ideas that you need to think about again. This topic is an important one that we should study and ponder, since Christ has told us it is required of us to cleanse the camp. Will we be like Christ in this matter, or will we shirk our Christian duty to expose error? Do we understand what true Christian love is? Love that at its core is concerned for those that are in sin and their salvation. Love that will speak up even though we'd rather keep quiet and not deal with issues. Sure, it can be unpleasant. It can grieve our souls to have to do it, as I'm sure it broke our Savior's heart, but it still must be done. So what is love or charity in this matter? In Acts of the Apostles, page 554 and 55, we read, You must have charity, is the cry heard everywhere. But true charity is too pure to cover an unconfessed sin. The Apostle teaches that while we should manifest Christian courtesy, we are authorized to deal in plain terms with sin and sinners, that this is not inconsistent with true charity. Let's look at another quote in Manuscript Release, Volume 15, page 156, to see how we're to deal with those in sin. To practice the principle of love will not prevent us from dealing plainly with our brethren, in kindness pointing out wrongs and shortcomings when it is necessary to do so. When you are yourself connected with God, you may speak plainly to those who by their crooked steps are turning the lame out of the path. We're not here to burn bridges with our brothers and sisters that are in the wrong. Hopefully one day they will turn from their wrong, be restored, and we can work together again. But we are to deal very plainly with them. 
Will you be ready to accept them back when they have repented and turned from their evil ways? In Evangelism, page 36, we read, The hearts of God's servants will overflow with love and sympathy for the erring, but they will have no soft words for sin. They show the truest friendship who reprove error and sin without partiality and without hypocrisy. Notice what 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15 says. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Though we rebuke a brother or sister, our attitude needs to be one of concern and hope that the brother or sister will one day be restored back to us, and not to treat them as an enemy. In Review and Herald, October 22, 1901, we read, True love is a love which seeks first the honor of God and the salvation of souls. Those who have this love will not evade the truth to save themselves from the unpleasant results of plain speaking. And in Signs of the Times, April 21, 1881, we read, Those who have the true love of God in their hearts will not teach that sin should be handled with gloved hands. The salvation of sinners demands that every Christian shall act his part and put forth a certain measure of positive power. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. The word must be spoken in season and out of season to those who are beguiled by Satan and led to do evil things. Satan is working through his agents and shall the soldiers of Christ exert no positive influence to save souls that are walking the broad road to death? It's interesting that Ellen White equates showing people their transgressions as a positive power. Do you equate it that way? Was Isaiah being critical or negative when he said, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins? In the book Prophets and Kings, we read how Jeremiah was treated by many of his own church members and leaders while in the house of the Lord for bringing this type of message to his church. On page 417 of Prophets and Kings, we read, Jeremiah's message to priests and people aroused the antagonism of many. With boisterous denunciation, they cried out, Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, this house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant. And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. Jeremiah 26, nine, Priests, false prophets, and people turned in wrath upon him, who would not speak to them smooth things or prophesy deceit. Thus was the message of God despised, and his servant threatened with death. On page 416 of Prophets and Kings, we read, let none charge the servants of God with being too zealous in endeavoring to cleanse the camp. Do you have this attitude toward those that endeavor to cleanse the camp? What about the church you belong to? Do they have that attitude? In the Review and Herald, July 25, 1893, we read, The office of a messenger whom God has chosen to send with reproofs and warnings is strangely misunderstood at the present time. Is it any different today? In Review and Herald, June 8, 1886, we read, Should a case like Aiken's be among us, there are many who would accuse those who might act the part of Joshua in searching out the wrong of having a fault-finding wicked spirit. In Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 283, we read, Opposition has risen in the church to the plain testimony. If the wrongs of individuals are touched, they complain of severity and, it goes on to say, are ready to overlook the wrong which made it necessary for reproof and rebuke. When the church depart from God, they despise the plain testimony and complain of severity and harshness. It is a sad evidence of the lukewarm state of the church. That's from Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 283 and 284. Here we see the results of those that are opposed to plain testimony, and how they are in a lukewarm state, a state which God has told us is worse than being hot or cold, and that he will spew them out. 
In Prophets and Kings, page 416, we read, What a lesson is this to men holding positions of responsibility today in the Church of God. What a solemn warning to deal faithfully with wrongs that bring dishonor to the cause of truth. Let none who claim to be the depositaries of God's law flatter themselves that the regard they may outwardly show toward the commandments will preserve them from the exercise of divine justice. Let none refuse to be reproved for evil, nor charge the servants of God with being too zealous in endeavoring to cleanse the camp from evil doing. A sin-hating God calls upon those who claim to keep his law to depart from all iniquity. A neglect to repent and to render willing obedience will bring upon men and women today as serious consequences as came upon ancient Israel. This is a solemn warning of what can and will happen to us, Seventh-day Adventists, if we fail to do God's will. What should we do when we know something is not right and darkness is settling over our church? In the third volume of the Testimonies, there's a short section titled, Duty to Reprove Sin, starting on page 265. I sincerely hope you will take the time to read these few pages when you have the chance. In this section, it says, When the people realize that darkness is settling upon them, and they do not know the cause, they should seek God earnestly, in great humility and self-abasement, until the wrongs which grieve his spirit are searched out and put away. Also in volume 3 of, te of the Testimonies, page 520, we read, It is a sin in any church not to search for the cause of their darkness in the midst of them. Remember the sins I spoke about in the first part of this presentation in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10? Does your church allow members to go unrebuked for sins such as adultery, fornication, drunkenness, preaching or teaching error, etc.? If so, it's your duty as a Christian to do your part by speaking up and helping correct these wrongs. Rebuke can be a very touchy subject for some people because they haven't studied it. What types of comments have you heard about a person that rebukes another person? Are the comments toward the rebuke typically critical or negative? Think about what was said of the prophets of old by those they rebuked. They were sometimes called the troublers of Israel. But in reality, who typically were the real troublers of Israel? Who were the ones that brought displeasure and punishment from God? What has the Lord revealed to us in the spirit of prophecy on how we should regard those that rebuke, assuming it's done in the proper manner? Volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 265 and 266. The prejudice which has arisen against us because we have reproved the wrongs that God has shown me existed, and the cry that has been raised of harshness and severity, are unjust. God bids us speak, and we will not be silent. If wrongs are apparent among his people, and if the servants of God pass on indifferent to them, they virtually sustain and justify the sinner, and are alike guilty, and will just as surely receive the displeasure of God, for they will be made responsible for the sins of the guilty. We must be very careful in condemning those that rebuke if they are doing so in the manner of Christ. And remember, the manner of Christ included telling a person that he didn't condemn them, but to go and sin no more. And it also included calling the open sinners, such as the Pharisees, that they were snakes and their father was the devil. If you are not comfortable with how and why Christ rebuked people in different ways, then you need to take the time to study this important topic more thoroughly. Let's look at another quote that tells us what will happen to us if we have a spirit of hatred toward rebuke. In Volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 266, we read, The spirit of hatred which has existed with some because the wrongs among God's people have been reproved has brought blindness and a fearful deception upon their own souls, making it impossible for them to discriminate between right and wrong. They have put out their own spiritual eyesight. They may witness wrongs, but they do not feel as did Joshua and humble themselves because the danger of souls is felt by them. Notice in this quote that there are some who do not 
deal justly, and some are needlessly severe with every one and every little thing, and they haven't learned to have compassion on those who need it. Remember how Christ could be stern with the Pharisees, yet recognized when to have compassion on certain sinners because of their repentant spirit and willingness to change. All are not fitted to correct the erring. They have not wisdom to deal justly while loving mercy. They are not inclined to see the necessity of mingling love and tender compassion with faithful reproofs. Some are ever needlessly severe and do not feel the necessity of the injunction of the apostle. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Third volume of the Testimonies, page 269. Though it says that some are needlessly severe and this is wrong, let's also realize that not all sternness is uncalled for with rebuke, so be careful here. Notice what is said about the Apostle Paul. Paul attracted warm hearts wherever he went. His soul was linked to the soul of his brethren. When he parted with them, knowing and assuring them that they would never see his face again, they were filled with sorrow and so earnestly besought him to still remain with them that he exclaimed, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? His sympathetic heart was breaking as he witnessed and felt their grief at this final separation. They loved him and felt that they could not give him up. What Christian does not admire the character of Paul? Firm as a rock when standing in defense of the truth, he was affectionate and gentle as a child when surrounded by his friends. But his rebuke of sin was terribly severe, especially to those who professed to believe in Christ and yet dishonored their profession. His heart was aglow with love, and yet when duty demanded, he could be stern with holy indignation. Let the example of Paul, whose life was in accordance with the life of Christ, be a lesson to us. That's from Review and Herald, September 8, 1885. We can find many cases from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy writings where stern rebuke is given. So obviously we can't automatically equate stern rebuke as being wrong, though it could be done in a wrong manner. Look at the manner in which it's done in the Bible, such as by Paul, when comparing to the way you have seen others do it. Look at how Paul, Ellen White, Elijah, Christ, and others did it, and they did it many times. Also be careful not to immediately discount sternness and rebuke. Just because it's stern doesn't immediately classify it as criticism or being wrong. Look for the message and the purpose as to why it's being given. Does the message agree with the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy writings? Even if there are those that give a wrong delivery of a message, we should at least try to understand what is the message they are trying to give and whether that message may apply to us and whether we are out of harmony with God's Word in some way and need to change our ways. Signs of the Times, May 12, 1881 Care should be exercised by all Christians to shun the two extremes of laxness in dealing with sin on the one hand and harsh judgment and groundless suspicion on the other. How do we regard the person that rebukes sin? There are many who do not have the discretion of Joshua and who have no special duty to search out wrongs and to deal promptly with the sins existing among them. Let not such hinder those who have the burden of this work upon them. Let them not stand in the way of those who have this duty to do. Some make it a point to question and doubt and find fault because others do the work that God has not laid upon them. These stand directly in the way to hinder those upon whom God has laid the burden of reproving and correcting prevailing sins in order that his frown may be turned away from his people. Should a case like Achan's be among us, there are many who would accuse those who might act the part of Joshua in searching out the wrong of having a wicked, fault-finding spirit. God is not to be trifled with, and his warnings disregarded with impunity by a perverse people. Thus, we should be very careful in what we say about those that rebuke sin in the Spirit of Christ. What can those that rebuke expect from other church members? Sadly, it's met by resistance by the unconsecrated. Those who work in the fear of God to rid the church of hindrances 
and to correct grievous wrongs, that the people of God may see the necessity of abhorring sin, and may prosper in purity, and that the name of God may be glorified, will ever meet with resisting influences from the unconsecrated. In the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, we have a definition of hypocrisy. It says, A person who acts in contradiction to his or her stated beliefs or feelings. What about the case where, as a Seventh-day Adventist church organization, the organization states one thing as a belief, yet allows or condones by silence a totally different belief or behavior within its organization of churches? This, too, would be hypocrisy. This is what's happening in our own church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, in areas of stated beliefs. Whether you believe the actual stated beliefs, such as our fundamental beliefs, is right or wrong is not the issue I'm talking about. The issue before us as Seventh-day Adventists is whether this hypocrisy should be allowed among the leadership, conferences, and unions. For example, today we have Seventh-day Adventist church leaders that state the best explanation for life on our planet is a literal six-day creation week, which I too believe. However, we have other church leaders and professors in our universities that teach or preach that long-term theistic evolution is the best, best explanation for life on our planet. This is hypocrisy and open division within our church, and we allow it. We have teachers or leaders in our universities that also believe and teach that same-sex loving relationships are acceptable to God. These two particular opposing beliefs, which have been present for many years within La Sierra University, I will talk about in another presentation. Also, the Seventh-day Adventist Church as an organization has not voted to ordain women pastors yet. Today, we have the Pacific Union Conference and the Columbia Union Conference pushing forward to ordain women no matter what the world church has voted. Where are our leaders that are watchmen? It doesn't matter whether they have actually made the vote yet or not, or even if this issue is right or wrong. It is still hypocrisy within our organizational leadership to be pushing for something our world church has voted no on. It is also hypocrisy for any of our churches to be ordaining women when the world church has said no. I urge our leadership in the North American Division to put a stop to this hypocrisy. Why have our leaders decided to go against the biblical counsel that tells us to let all things be done decently and in order? We have leaders that talk about wanting revival and reformation, yet revival and reformation cannot take place until open confession of public sins has taken place. We cannot expect God's Spirit to be poured out on any church when it allows open sin in the camp. I also urge our leaders in other countries and divisions to open their eyes and put a stop to all the hypocrisy that is currently being allowed and taking place in the North American Division. We must stop ignoring what is taking place in our organization, and open confession must take place. We need leaders that will stand up and call sin, sin. Allowing open sin did not work for Israel, and it will not work for us. The greatest one of the world is the one of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Mark 3.25 tells us, And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. This is where we're headed as a church unless we repent and change our ways. Remember Nineveh? Jonah brought them a message, and they publicly repented of their evil ways, turned from them, and were spared. Will we, as Seventh-day Adventists, repent publicly of our public sins, or will we be a house divided that will not stand? The result is up to us, but we must act. If not, our silence will convict us. What will happen to those that excuse sin? Who are standing in the council of God at this time? Is it those who virtually excuse wrongs among the professed people of God and who murmur in their hearts, if not openly, against those who would reprove sin? Is it those who take their stand against them and sympathize with those who commit wrong? No, indeed, 
unless they repent and leave the work of Satan in oppressing those who have the burden of the work and in holding up the hands of the sinners in Zion, they will never receive the mark of God's sealing approval. They will fall in the general destruction of the wicked. If God abhors one sin above another, of which his people are guilty, it is of doing nothing in a case of emergency. Indifference or neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. Arduous and unpleasant duties have to be performed. None are to place themselves where they will sanction wrong by silence. They aid and abet the schemes of the enemy by keeping their lips closed when they should speak decidedly. Many have tried neutrality in a crisis, but they have failed in their purpose. No one can maintain a neutral ground. Those who endeavor to do this will fulfill Christ's words. No man can serve two masters. They will at last be found enlisted on the enemy's side. The Lord has placed before us a solemn task in dealing with sin. Will we be faithful and follow the Spirit of Christ in dealing with sin, or will we be indifferent and neutral? May the Lord bless you as you study his word, and especially as you study about how to deal with sin in the church, which affects all church members and leaders.